Good evening, and welcome to She Opened the Door. And to many of you, welcome back to Columbia University. I'm conference co-chair Kathleen Crowley, Public Health, and I'm so thrilled about the university's first women's conference, opening the door, engaging alumni and students. Because this weekend spans 18 schools and affiliates, it is a celebration of the collaborative spirit among the university, an opportunity for alumni, students, and faculty to exchange ideas and experience the networking that being an alumni has to offer. The cross-school collaboration made the planning of this inaugural event extremely rewarding. We want to recognize and thank the numerous volunteers, the alumni leadership group, the CAA and alumni relations team, who partnered with university leadership, saw the importance of this effort to bring alumni together through seven decades and engage alumni across the university, a sign of more to come. Where it all started. The She Opened the Door name refers to Winifred Edgerton Merrill, the first woman to earn a Columbia degree. She attended Wellesley and applied to Columbia to have access to the university's telescope and observatory for post-grad research. Merrill's classmates gave a two-minute round of applause at her 1886 graduation. And marking her 50th anniversary of her Wellesley graduation, the class of 1883 gave Columbia a portrait of Merrill and it was inscribed, she opened the door. Women engagement at Columbia is incredibly important. Central to the university's commitment to the world is a belief that in just societies, people's chances are not diminished because of a race, religion, economic background, or gender. We want to build an equitable, inclusive world starting right here on campus. The new vision and moniker of the Columbia Alumni Association CEA, build, belong, bond. And this serves as an entree for tonight's keynote. But before we start, I do have a few housekeeping issues. Following the program, we invite you to stay in this room and enjoy some time to bond with your fellow alumni here in the rotunda. If you haven't downloaded the app, do so. It will keep you informed not only of the agenda, but also of the many ways you can open a door to someone who couldn't attend in person. You can connect with fellow alums there, build a new alumni relationship, and this is where announcements will be posted throughout the weekend. Please bring your name badge because this is your ticket for registration. If you have any questions about your registrations, please visit the registration table. And when you feel inspired during this weekend, you have an opportunity to contribute to a crowdsourced public history of the university community. Visit you, you columbia.edu and share your story. Without further ado, tonight's program concerns women's voices and their role in building peace. Due to illness, Lema Gabawi won't be able to join us, but in true Colombian form, fellow alumni Abigail Disney will most certainly keep us riveted. Abigail's full bio is in the conference app but I'd like to share a few highlights. Abigail Disney, an Emmy Award winner, a filmmaker. She is CEO and president of Fork Films, a philanthropist, an 87 and 94 alumna of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, executive producer of The Tale, which just premiered at Sundance Film Festival. 
She will share her thoughts on the power and importance of filmmaking as a peace-building tool. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that tonight's themes surround us in the Peace and Security Programs Photography Exhibit. This is presented in the display here in the rotunda. You are encouraged, following this program, to take a look. The format tonight will include a question and answer period following the keynote. Please know that with us, C-SPAN has joined us tonight for the conversation. When you do ask a question, we please ask that you state your name, your school, and your year. Now please join me in welcoming Abigail Disney. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're the best. Hello, y'all. Good evening. I, I brought along a bag that is supposed to remind you of Mary Poppins' bag because I have some audio treats or visual treats for you. Now, I had two ladies who promised to be volunteers for me. Can you, can you come up here for a second? I am painfully aware that Lema Bowie is pretty exciting and that I am not. <laughs> I am painfully aware that she called me this morning and said, I have the flu. I can't get out of bed. Um, so I brought her with me in imperfect form. This is a photograph my husband took the day she got her Nobel Prize. And she's going right here. There you go. I even brought painter's tape so you wouldn't destroy the podium. There you go. So she's going to be looking down on us. We'll have her spirit with us all the way through. I came to Columbia in 1984. Um, the city was a different place then. <laughs> Times Square was a different place then. <laughs> a lot was different then. Um, I came here to study in the English department, um, and I ended up writing a dissertation on American literature. And it's funny because, you know, if, if, if Rush Limbaugh and Phyllis Shafley had had a baby, that would have been my mother. So I was not a person who called herself a feminist at the time. Um, but I was highly attuned to the way American novels, at least, are like a, 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 an obsession with men, men obsessed with themselves. And if you pay attention from Huckleberry Finn through Norman Mailer, through some of our most popular novelists now, you'll realize that it's, it's an exercise in understanding masculinity. I wasn't a feminist. Oh, that's so funny, I have an alarm going off. Hang on a second. I love this guy. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <coughs> I, I was a tomboy. In fact, in the ninth grade, I played on the boys' soccer team, one of the first in Southern California to do it. I scored a goal, an assist, and a yellow card. <laughs> just, just that badass. Um, I was obsessed with the spaces women weren't allowed into. And I ended up writing a dissertation on war novels, which was a strange thing to do, but I was obsessed with it because a war novel is like a locker room conversation. They assume the women aren't there listening to what they've got to say. And it is the truest, most honest place to go looking for what it is they think life means and why it is they were put on this earth. So I pursued pretty heavily a study in weapons and weapons technology and how they influenced war tactics and what it is that American novelists did with all that in terms of understanding themselves as effective men as compared against, say, Homer's men in the Iliad. And, uh, and that was just a very weird thing for me to do. <laughs> I had two babies along the way, and I would you know, nurse my babies, and then I would sit down to a book full of why Gatling invented the machine gun. And it was a little bit of cognitive dissonance. Um, but, I, but I decided to stay home for a while, um, because my kids were little and I liked them. In fact, I was shocked by how much I liked them. I did not see that coming in my life plan. <laughs> so I wound up staying home, close to home, while they were little. 
And, uh, and, I, and I worked very hard at the New York Women's Foundation on, as a volunteer on the grant committee. And the leash was very short, and that was very serendipitous because what it meant was that I couldn't go wide, but I could go very deep. Um, and I learned a lot about what it was that women do when they organize in neighborhoods. I learned a lot about who those women tend to be and what it is they tend to do. Um, so that 20 years later, when I did give myself permission to set foot out there into the world and ask what it is that I might do that might be useful, I found myself in Liberia. Now, I found myself in Liberia, I acknowledge, is not a normal sentence. Uh, normal people don't find themselves in Liberia. I've had a thousand versions of the question, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like that? Um, <coughs> I had gotten increasingly interested in women's leadership and whether it would make a difference and why it might make a difference. And the president of Liberia at the time had just been elected right out of the end of a civil war, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She had been elected with a tidal wave of women coming out to vote. And my friend who was very much involved in the international world of women's politics said to me, why don't you come with me, you know, and let's see what we discover. So I went there, certainly with not, not with a film in my head, with just kind of what can I learn in my head. It was rather overwhelming. I'd never, I'd never been in a place that recently out of trauma and conflict, and I will tell you it is a, you, that level of trauma is almost physically hanging in the air. You, you, you almost have to cut your way through it with a, an emotional machete, it's so painful. And when you look at the number of bullet holes, um, you, you wonder who you would be and how much strength you would have in that situation. And I met some extraordinary women along the way. And every time I chatted with them, they would say, well, you know, when we were all sitting out on the field for two years in the rain and the sun and whatever, and they would refer to it like, it, I, of course I knew what that was and what happened, and I'd say, what? And so over the course of the week that I was there, I pulled these little shreds and fragments of things that got mentioned to me and I kind of started to put them together like a jigsaw puzzle only with like a tenth of the pieces. And I started to figure out something had happened here. And something had happened here and I didn't know what it was. And I read the New York Times and I pay attention and I know what's going on in the world. Something had happened there and everybody had missed it. So I came home wondering what it was that I needed to do. I, I said to my husband the night before I left, I'm, I shouldn't go. I'm gonna come home feeling obligated, you know, and, and I don't have time to be obligated. I've got too much to do already. And he said, you need to go, which is like, that's such a good husband, right? Um, I did come home feeling obligated to something I didn't expect at all, which was I knew a story that nobody knew and human decency required me to make sure that people heard it, because those women deserved to be heard and recognized and seen and remembered for what it was that they had done. And I'll give you the short version of it, because I, I don't know, many of you may have seen the film, um, but it basically, um, the Civil War had gone on and on and on for years. Rape, pillage, the countries in just tatters, and then finally the women get together and say, enough. You've had your chance, this is enough. And they started sitting on the field, even though the president, Charles Taylor, had said, I'll kill my own mother if she protests. They go out to the field in white every day. White is the color of mourning. They worked out their differences between the Muslim and the Christian women so that no one could divide them from each other. They learned each other's prayers. And they sat in the rain and the sun. And when you say rain and sun in Liberia, you need to know the rain is a fire hose <laughs> and the sun is the fire. That's how hot and how rainy it gets in Liberia. But they sat there. And eventually they were able to pray, uh, persuade the president to go to Ghana to the peace talks. And they went to Sierra Leone and they, they were able to persuade the opposition to go to the peace talks. So time goes on. They go to the peace talks with everybody. The peace talks break down over the same corrupt ridiculousness that it always does. And, uh, and the women finally had had enough. And they surrounded the whole building the peace talks were taking place in. 
They locked their arms and they sent a note inside saying, we're taking you hostage for the women of Liberia. It was an extraordinary moment. And when security came to arrest them, Lema Bowie, their leader, started to strip naked. And security said, we're not arresting you. Um, they were able to dictate that within two weeks, an agreement had to be signed, an election had to be held, or they were coming back and bringing twice as many women. And sure enough, in two weeks, the election, the, the, the agreement was signed, the election took place, and they had just the first peaceful transfer of power in the history of Liberia, or at least in the recent history of Liberia, just a couple weeks ago. It's an amazing thing. I, I, had, I didn't want to make a film. You know, I came from a filmmaking family, and you have to understand, like, if I fail, everybody's going to be like, who fails with your last name? What kind of an idiot? <laughs> you know? But if I succeed, everybody says, well, pfft, of course you succeeded. Duh, you got that last name. So it was kind of a zone of no-go for me, and I couldn't see how I was going to win. But I, but I could see that the only way I could make sure the story was fully appreciated and the way it needed to be appreciated was if I made a documentary or film out of it. So luck would have it that I found a great director. We made a film. It went to Tribeca. It won Best Documentary at Tri Tribeca. It was called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. It got shortlisted for the Academy Award that year. It did very, very well. And the instant it came out, something really interesting had happened. And that is, I, I was serving on the board of the Global Fund for Women, which, which had me kind of meeting women from all over the world who were all human rights defenders. And so I was beginning to understand that like those ladies I was meeting all over New York City who were really, really badass organizers and really, really amazing were exactly the same as Lema and all the women around her. And Lema was exactly the same as all those women on the Global Fund board. And the minute the film came out, they started calling me and saying, you need to come here now, today, to Lima, Peru, and show this film. The first screening outside the country was in Bosnia, in Srebrenica, where there'd been a horrific massacre of Muslim men. And we showed it in the town hall with half Serbian and half Bosnian women. And we had the most extraordinary conversation. So I went to, here comes my next prop. I'm so excited about my props. You have to give props to my props. <laughs> I went to 32 countries in just under two years. And this is my prop. This is what a passport looks like when you go to 32 countries in a year and a half. I was invited again and again and again to these places. And what happened in Bosnia after that screening happened exactly the same way in every country I went to. You could set your watch by it. There were tears. There was some re-traumatization about which I felt terrible. And then there was some woman who said, you know, I remember that woman reminded me of my cousin or my sister, or I saw that happen in our context. They started pulling out of it the things they recognized. They started seeing themselves in women. These are Eastern European women, and women who are very different from their own experience. They started seeing themselves, and then one woman invariably stood up 20 minutes in, pulled up her sleeves. These women always pull up their sleeves. <laughs> and she said, I know. That's what they did there, but what are we going to do here today? We've got problems to solve. Let's talk about the problems we're going to solve. And over and over and over again, I watched little movements get born. I felt like the best midwife ever. So something else happened. And this is a bit of a sidebar. Where are my volunteers again? Where are my volunteers? There they are. And this is a little bit off on a, 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 um, a sidebar, but nevertheless. The other thing that I found was everywhere I went, Mickey Mouse was there. <laughs> everywhere I went. And I started collecting him. And I'm going to give half of these to you and half of these to you. And I want you to send some on the back left there and the other half on the front right here. Just pass them around. Keep one if you want. They are my favorite things in the world because they are proof positive that, you know, everyone wants joy. No matter how bad the world has gotten, no matter horrible. One of them is from a concentration camp in Germany. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's, it, it goes to the question of, 
how it is that you build peace. So what I started to discover is what you're here to talk about. It's not just a question of she opened the door. Why did she open the door? What's on the other side of that door? You know, if we're going to walk through that door and be the same people standing on the other side, if we're going to change the demographics of the room that we want to get into and only the demographics, I'm sorry, count me out. I mean, parity is important, and it's important to have the same fair chance everybody else has. But we're talking about paradigm shift. We're talking about paradigm shift here. And every place I went, I felt so intensely that paradigm shift was possible when women show up with all of themselves to talk about social problems. Invariably, in the United States, when I talk about this, I get a pushback and it's invariably Margaret Thatcher. So, sometimes it's other people, but, but I'll use Margaret Thatcher as the example. No, all women on earth are not peaceful goddesses. Um, we know we, we've got a Sarah Palin running around and a Michelle Bachman running around. We know that all women aren't necessarily peace builders. Um, but we also know that when a woman is alone in the room, she can't bring all of herself to that job. And if you have to climb over a pile of shit to get to the top, you're gonna to be covered in shit when you get there, right? But if you can find your way into the room with three or four or five other women or people of color or queer people or anybody who's been locked out of the mainstream, you're gonna bring all of yourself to the decision making. And women everywhere on earth are charged with feeding, clothing, educating, housing, finding security, taking the dead out, caring for the sick, raising the young. If you want to find one word to explain what all of those things are, if you want to find a file folder to put them in, I suggest you call them life. Because that's what we're in charge of. So I asked a warlord, and again, another really good sentence that you know nobody, <laughs> in the process of making the film, why? When, you know, as many as three quarters of the women have been raped, you obviously have no regard for the women's sexual self-determination. How is it possible that one woman stripping naked causes you guys to go so completely bananas? And he looked at me like I was stupid. And he said, there were our mothers. And I was like, mm, I'm gonna need more than that. He said, there wasn't one man in that room in that moment who didn't ask himself, how did I caused this? How did I get us to this place? And if you just ask yourself, during that shutdown conversation yesterday, if there had been enough women in the room, enough mothers to shame them into remembering who they are, what would go differently? You know, a woman's voice has a different register and it's interesting when Hillary was running for president so often, actually, that was one of the criticisms of her, was her voice. And I think that the presence of a female voice in the public discourse is so categorically different just in the sound, right? That it disrupts things and it makes people uncomfortable. But when you think about that voice and who we are as human beings, it doesn't apply to everybody on earth, but this applies to most of us. What is the first voice you ever heard? And what did it sound like? And who was the first person who said to you, I love you? I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make you safe. It's going to be all right. Don't hit. Don't bite. Share your toys. That's what women bring if they bring all of themselves to the job. So a year and a half to almost two years later, I'm standing there in Monterrey in northern Mexico where women are getting disappeared right, left, and center. And I'm talking about women and peace and peace building. Another goodie. They gave me this. The Federales actually detained me when I tried to leave the country. I'm not going to throw this one at you. It's really heavy. You can pass it around. Um, it has two empty bullet casings in it. Because two empty bullet casings you walk by in Monterey every day on the sidewalk. And they had one of their artists make a sculpture out of it. 
so I was giving my usual thing about why women matter and why peace is our special thing. And about halfway through, I thought about the quarter of a million weapons that make their way from Texas and Arizona down into Mexico every year and the way we fuel with our drug habits everything that's going wrong in northern Mexico. And I was talking, I was talking, I was feeling this feeling of sickness rise in me because the hypocrisy of it was so bad. I, I was so ashamed. And so I just stopped right in the middle and I said, I just can't keep doing this. I'm an American woman and I know what my country does. And I, how dare I come talk to you about peace and peace building and not attempt to build peace in my own country. I promise you I'm going to go home and do what I can. So really that's been my focus primarily ever since, has been to figure out how can I be a force for peace in my own country. We are maybe not having shots fired over our heads every day. You're not worried about an RPG landing in your living room as the women in Liberia were, but we're more of a, a war country than Liberia ever has been. No one makes and produces more weapons. No country is in more universal cross-party agreement about how military po postures should be. No country creates more media and film and games that glorify war, that make it look noble, that make it look like the only way to solve a problem is to pick up a weapon and fire it. We are a problem. And if you want to fix the world, stay home, fix this. This is everybody's problem. If we don't stop exporting weapons, if we don't stop exporting the ideology, I think of it as the hardware and the software of a war mentality, you know, I don't know where this world will land, but today, at this moment, there are more than 800 million small arms in circulation around the world. 90% of them are not in the hands of armies or police. And we produce enough ammunition every year to kill everybody on the planet twice. There is a point at which we have enough weapons. And there is a point at which we have to ask ourselves, have our old ways of solving problems failed us? Is there a new way to understand things? How amazing is this moment we're standing upon? How amazing is this moment when women are standing tall and saying, me too. My form of peace building was to deploy my name, which I'm saying nicely. Normally I say I whore it out. Um, I like to whore out my name whenever I can. It's kind of a pain in my ass for the most part, so if I can use it for something meaningful, I feel really excited. And in this case, um, Right-wing evangelicals love my name, love my name. They ask me for my autograph wherever I go. So I knew that that would give me credibility in, in the world of evangelicals. I knew that there would be somebody over there on planet pro-life who really meant what they said about every human life being sacred. And I might disagree with them violently about abortion, but I suspect I was going to agree with them about most everything else. In fact, what I said to the person I ended up working with, I think you're going to figure out, if we just put this aside and talk about everything else long enough, you're going to figure out that we're fighting with each other because we're alike, not different. And that's exactly what happened. And I made a film called Armor of Light. And the idea was to, to, to not speak to conservatives or liberals, but to, but to take the discourse to the space, which is ample, above politics. And we spend no time in the space above politics. And it was a really powerful, meaningful thing. And I spent about two years traveling with the minister from my film to very far right-wing churches and talking to ministers and talking to people in Bible schools and so forth. And they gave me the microphone. And they let me speak fully aware of my politics. Um, and we had the most extraordinary conversations about guns. You know, with a documentary, you kind of have to bite off a bite that's big enough that it matters, but not so big that you can't chew it. So that was the first of my attempts to try and make a dent in the warm mentality of my country. And it is based entirely upon what I've learned over the years from women like Lema Bowie and women around the world who've, who've built peace movements around the world. Um, Someone once told me that 
You will find your joy when your heart's greatest gladness meets the world's deepest needs, which is beautiful, right? So there's a visual aid for what that looks like. This is what it looks like. Oh, thank you. I said, your heart's greatest gladness meets the world's deepest needs. Uh, I'm just finishing a second round of Women, War, and Peace films that will be on the air hopefully in the next year on PBS. Um, and I go back to this question of, she opened the door. Um, I think anybody in this room can probably name three or four women that you and I have never heard of who opened the door for them, right? I, it's not just the famous women that are important. And the, that women matter is one of the most important pieces of information you need to have. If, if you want to know what really, really works in changing the world, pay attention to what the bad guys are doing because they're often there before we are in terms of doing what they need to do to destroy what's working. And look at what they're doing to women around the world. Look at what they're doing to women inside of this country. Look at 82% of the pornography on Pornhub.com has acts of aggression and violence in them. We matter. Steve Bannon said today, <laughs> he said this today, I swear to God I'm not making this up. The movement against patriarchy is going to change everything. It's going to be more powerful than the Tea Party. Now, he was saying that because it's bad news. <laughs> you know, have you ever asked yourself why we care about Anne Frank? You know, Anne Frank was just a little girl. Just, just a little girl. Do you think if it were Andrew Frank we pay as much attention. You know, I, I care about and I love 13-year-old boys. I've had two of them. Oh my God, they're the best people in the world. But there's a reason why Anne Frank res resonated, and that is because it's not just that she wasn't a combatant, she wasn't a participant, she was innocent as it gets. She was never going to be guilty. She was never going to get sucked in. That's what she represented. She represented peace. And that's why we study her to this day. So for us, the question is, where does your heart's deepest gladness meet the world's greatest need? What can you do to change this country, your context? What can you do to make this a kinder, better, gentler world right around us? And who will you open the door for? It's not just a question of walking through it, but holding it open for the people behind you. Who will be better and what will be better because you chose to walk through that door. So thank you so much. Oh, stop. OK, so we have Q&A time, um, plenty of it. I love nothing more than an A. So, um, so, so send me some cues. Send me some cues. Anybody? Yes. We have runners with mics. And while the runner, um, but they're really walkers with mics. Um, but tell us your name and the school you graduated from. So given your perspective on opening today's environment in the United States, what do you think the perspective needs to be for women who have risen to leadership ranks mm. to kind of help others given today's political environment? Right. 
and right, how do right. we activate this in a sustainable fashion? Yeah. Well, it depends on what you mean by today's political environment, because we have, you know, we have the, the Donald Trump political environment, but then we have the root cause of the Donald Trump political environment, which is much larger than Donald Trump, and and that's and that's um, an environment of retrenchment and reaching for security blankets and wanting things to return to what they looked like before and and feel comfortable and so forth. It's a um, it's I think a natural reaching backwards. Um, but you know, we, this moment is amazing. I mean, this moment of Me Too and all that has happened because of that, I've never seen women stand this way and I've never seen them stand together so well. And I've never seen women um, not back down because somebody told them, oh, their voice was too shrill or they were sounding ugly or whatever it was. I mean, that's what we often, in my generation, back down because of. Um, so I think that, that, that we need to support those movements and we need to stop undercutting each other, which we often do, with questions about, oh, she seems a little crazy to me, um, or um, she's, you know, she's just a little too disruptive, or why is she so feisty, or she's gonna scare the men away. Um, so we need to be more supportive, less ready with a question, less ready with a criticism. We need to take a woman like Rose McGowan, who uh, is crazy <laughs> and is shrill, and she's all these things. She also has a lot to say about being raped by Harvey Weinstein. So why are we leading with the criticism? Um, let's, let's support what she has to say that is, in fact, valid and right. It doesn't negate everything else. So I think an emphasis on supporting each other is going to be really important. I also, I started the New York Women's Foundation around 1992, and we had a lot of women who were pretty high up in the big accounting firms and the big law firms and so forth. And they were pretty high up. They were all the way at the top, and they were topping out at that glass ceiling. Um, they talked a lot about women's networking and bringing women in behind them, but most of them were the only woman in the room in the rooms they were in. Um, I, I ha I'm getting, I'm, I'm starting a studio, which is another one of those sentences, um, with a group of women filmmakers. And um, I met one of those women I knew back in 1992, who's now way up there at one of the banks, who said, I said to her, the last domino that needs to come down for women in the media is the $200 million line of credit that nobody asks Harvey Weinstein a second question about, and yet we can't get our hands on that. And she said, why don't you come into my office and talk about that? So we have also arrived at a very different historical moment because that woman's not alone at the top of where she is, and she has more than enough clout to make something like that happen. So if we don't put together the women who've raised their voices and all their integrity and identity with the women who've, we, we have a chance here that really could be materially different. Yeah. Yes. I'm Radhita, I will graduate in 2019 from Columbia College. And so I wanted to ask, how do you think we can in the arts, in popular media, in everyday life, begin to normalize and incorporate the narratives of those who are seen as outside of the hegemonic, outside of mainstream. Right. Well, I think that we've gone a, a long way towards starting that process just in the last couple of years. So my interest is primarily in media, um, because that just, I just, you know, bah. Um, I just wound up there. <laughs> um, and what's happening in media right now around people like Ava DuVernay directing A Wrinkle in Time with a $50 million budget, I mean, that just doesn't happen. Women have been making $10 million movies for $5 million for a long time. And nobody's ever really trusted them, you know, at the big budget films. So um, she, is, she is somebody who's not gonna apologize for anything or sugarcoat anything to make everybody feel better. Um, Black Panther is huge, that's a huge thing, and it's gonna do very well. Wonder Woman was huge. So, so there are the big blockbustery kinds of things, but there's also some really important stuff happening around the edges. Independent film has a way of reaching into the nooks and crannies. I think of it as like the big movies, their fingers are too fat, but there's all these really great rivulets of influence which you can reach with a small independent film. And um, 
and the number of women producers that have approached me since we announced this new studio is kind of amazing. Um, so, and, and most of the women producers are not interested in making a film about just another woman trying to break the glass ceiling. You know, I, that's Ivanka feminism, right? <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm gonna assume we're okay with that here. <laughs> but but I, there was always a tension in the rooms I was in early in, the, early in the day between the women who just wanted to break the glass ceiling and make work better um, and the women who said, well, you know, if you're getting raped on the way to work, that's really not going to help. Um, and so the, it tended to fall along, along um, lines of race and sexual orientation and, and income levels. So that white, upper middle class and middle class working women tended to fall into this, but the wage gap thing. Um, and that's one reason that feminists get such a hard um, and deserved reputation for not really caring much about everyone else. Um, what I'm noticing about the women in these producing spaces is they're intersectional feminists. They really do want to tell the whole story. And you know, up until Gina Davis has been doing this incredible work, up until about two years ago, 82%, it's going to blow your mind, of crowd scenes were male. Men. That, just think about that. Um, and it's not that big a deal to put 50% women in your damn crowd scene. Years ago, when James Cameron made Alien, the first Alien film, I don't know if you know this, but that was written for an all-male cast. And somebody got the bright idea of casting a woman as Ripley, and they didn't change a word of dialogue. And that became an incredible film, but nobody ever recognized it as the feminist landmark that it was, because that was incredible. And then nobody ever did it again. Um, they put the women right back in the box. In fact, the second alien ended up being some stupid mom plot. Um, so, so the women who are doing this now um, have really brought a, a full um, acceptance that when we paradigm shift, it's, there's no point in doing it unless it shifts for everybody. I feel like I should like, but. Hi, I'm Teresa Saputo Creer and uh, Columbia College, Columbia Business School. And I was very struck by what you said that you found common ground with the evangelists, people that you disagree so much with on some very fundamental issues. <laughs> and I think America and Americans with all the fights that are happening on social media and Twitter and we have leaders that are starting fights every day. We need some tips on mm. how to find common ground with yeah. the other because I agree with you, yeah. it's there, but I think that could make a real difference. So if you have tips to share, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we in New York City really face the challenge of being physically separate. I mean, that's just part of the problem is that we've retreated into spaces of like-minded people right down to where you get your coffee. I mean, liberals go to Starbucks and conservatives go to Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know if you know that. Wouldn't be caught dead in a Starbucks. Um, so, so this has gotten ridiculous. So it, it, if, I don't think you're gonna find common ground on social media. It's, it's just like walking through a, a room that's been sprayed with fire starter, you know, and just one match, one spark. So it's just not a stable place emotionally for people. And, it's, it's, and I'm, I am just as much of a jerk on Twitter as the next person. I have my attitude problem there too. Um, and I don't think it's gonna happen on Facebook either. So we're gonna have to create human spaces. We do forget that humans actually prefer to gather as humans in physical spaces face to face. Um, and we need, what I learned about Rob, the minister from my film was, you know, I kind of started the process thinking, and then I'm gonna completely change his mind about everything, and I'm gonna turn him into a pro-choice <laughs> liberal. And, uh, and, and then once I got to know him, and he was such a lovely human being, just who he was, as much as choice is like fundamental for me, I thought, God, I hope he doesn't change his mind. <laughs> that would be terrible. 
Um, and I know that sounds maybe a little crazy, but what I've learned is you don't change anybody if you set out to change their mind. That any conversation you're gonna have is, is just fully in bad faith. Um, what you need to do is walk in with humility and kindness and trust. And that may be hard to do. You know, we all have in our families probably somebody who is really difficult, my older brother. And, uh, and I, so I'll be very quick to say to you, but he never reaches out to me. He never trusts me. He's never kind of me. Why would I bother? You know, and so the, if you want to build peace, it takes some sacrifice. And uh, it, it means that you have to be the one who takes the first step and takes a nice deep breath when he baits you, when he tries to get you into the argument. That's just the only dynamic that that, that, that person understands. And you have to change the nature of the way you interact. So you need, it's usually going to be in your families that you find people to get to know and to talk to. Um, just don't try to change their minds and start with them where they are. Sorry, there was a woman right behind you. Hi, my name is Maria Sipa 2019. I am from Colombia, and we are in, in such an incredible moment of our history. And um, I guess this is kind of a big ask and a big question, but you having the opportunity to go around the world in over 38 countries, I think you said, and talk to these amazing women and amazing yeah. girls. I want to ask, how do you go forward? How do you empower young women? How do you empower your friends? How do you empower your little sister to speak when this is not the life, this is not the world we grew up in. Yeah. Even ourselves that are young, how do you create a new environment when it's okay yeah. to raise your hand and it is okay to say, I have an opinion and I want to be heard? Right, right. I mean, I know I feel your pain, I really do, because I was so punished in my own family for, I, I don't know, I, I think there are women who just, there was a memo that was handed out when we were all born that said, please be quiet, don't use your loud voice. And you know, I think everybody else got the memo and somebody didn't give me the memo. Um, and as I've gotten older, I figured out there, there are women I really love who didn't get the memo either. You know, Billie Jean King didn't get the memo and whatever. So I had a little bit of an advantage in that I was really kind of oblivious and didn't really care um, whether or not people approved of me. Um, and I, and I feel very lucky because um, the, I think I've not wasted a lot of energy on trying to please the people around me who weren't going to be pleased no matter what I did anyway. Um, so the first thing is to let go um, and be the person you really know that you are. You know, honestly, you know, as I was getting started and people were asking me to speak and asking me to do interviews and stuff like that, I, I definitely got a sense that if I lost about 30 pounds, they'd ask me on CNN every night. <laughs> I really, I think that's true. And, um, and I thought, well, hell no. That's like way more work than I'm, <laughs> you know? And, um, and so, no, I'm, I'm, my friends here will tell you, I am Falstaff. I'm the girl version of Falstaff and I love to party and whatever. So, so I, I decided long ago that I wasn't gonna change a thing about my, the fundamental aspects of who I was. And if I broke through or made a name for myself, it was just going to be on my own terms and my own way. Trust yourself. You are good enough just exactly as you are. Uh, my name is Wanda uh, Benvenuti. I'm a graduate of the journalism school. And my question is actually more of a spiritual one. Uh, you were speaking earlier. Uh, about cultivating peace and so much, I mean, we have to acknowledge a privilege in the room. Um, and I know that there are people in the room that, <clears throat> excuse me, have been triggered by the Me Too movement. Uh, it's difficult to be an effective communicator and remember that but cultivating peace within is the first step, obviously. And I, I'm very curious, I mean, obviously I'm a journalist, uh, and I just actually sent you a message on Instagram <laughs> uh, because, you know, some things you have to ask directly. How do you take care of yourself? This is heavy spiritual work. As women, we are uh, expected because of all kinds of gender specific and cultural traditions uh, to nurture everyone else. And we forget, we forget yeah. that, you know what? <laughs> Sometimes Ami needs a break. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. I, and I, I openly ask women this every day now yeah. because I'm not gonna lie to you, it's been a really hard two years. 
Yeah, you know, don't ever stop asking that question because I think it helps people remember that it's okay. Because I think a lot of my friends think that it's not allowed because, you know, you're only given so many years and you have to do as much as you can in the time that you have. Um, and, and I definitely fall prey to that, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead routine. And, uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm partly very, very blessed in my temperament, which is I just, I just default to joy. <laughs> I'm just really lucky. And, um, and when I'm in a room full of eight pieces of bad news and one piece of good news, I'm like, well, at least, you know, we still have almonds to eat, you know, or something like that. So I, I, do, I do almost pathologically look at the bright side. Um, and, and that's a temperament thing. But, but I remember there was my first time in Liberia, there was a woman who told me the most horrific, most awful rape story. And, uh, and I was like, well, thank you very much for this. And blah, blah, blah. And I left the room and I sat down at lunch. And then they served me a plate of food. And then I just almost threw up all over the table. And I went up to my room and I laid down. I just had to lie down. It was like, I didn't know what else to do but be horizontal. Um, I wasn't listening to my body, and I was in a state of adrenaline, and I had never heard anything like this in my life, and I didn't know how to incorporate it into how I understand humans should behave. So, so you know, once in a while, well, you have to lie down, or you have to meditate, or you have to do whatever. I've been meditating lately, and honestly, it's just one of the most major changes I've ever made in my life. I feel like that's huge. So I also went back to church, which is really funny because when I hang out with the evangelicals, they're all in this big contest to see who can like reel me in, you know? <laughs> they they end up like notches on their bedposts. I'm like, get one. Um, so the last thing I wanted to do was tell Rob I was back at church because he would be like, ching. Um, but I did find myself thinking that I miss much as I did not miss my Catholic upbringing and did not long for anything about being a Catholic, I did miss the habit of gathering. And we need to gather. I mean, we need time alone, we need to meditate, but we need to gather and we need to sit for an hour once in a while with people who want to talk about the meaning of life. <laughs> That's what you do, right? That's the essence of it. And, uh, and so I found the most hippie, gayest, most atheist church you can possibly find. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and it's the perfect place on earth because literally every week we talk about why we've been put on this earth. So I, you know, um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So this lady's been so nice and patient. <laughs> Hi. I'm Ruth Curtis, um, SEPA 71. And I'm sitting here and I'm getting this feeling where there, there are multiple universes of experience rather than one stream forward. Because I grew up in Alabama in the segregated South and the tradition that I grew up in, I grew up on a college campus, was that you did speak out, it's just nobody was listening. Oh. But we talked to each other yeah. and that f fueled us to continue and to keep doing what we, want, what we needed to do. I mean it's not the same issues necessarily um, that are the focus now with regard to rape and, and, and that kind of thing that mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, women who are moving into high places and having to deal with men in higher places but and that's why I'm saying parallel universe because um, it was it was racism and holding people back and denying denying the humanity of um, certain of a group of people so the whole idea of your voice and uh, supporting people who speak out was there. It just wasn't being heard until yeah. the whole civil rights era took yeah. place. So I just wanted to mention that as a right. dimension of this whole discussion right. that needs to be acknowledged. Thank you for that. And, um, I think a thing that gets missed in the conversation we have about speaking up um, is the role of humility and knowing when it's appropriate for you to be the person to speak as opposed to somebody else. Um, like three billboards was made by a man and I keep thinking to myself like, did you really have to direct that film? 
because some woman have directed it, really, because, like, really, did you have to? And um, white women have done a terrible job of, of accepting our role in, in um, racism, systemic racism, across the decades and centuries in this country. Um, I come from a family that owns slaves in Louisiana. Um, and, uh, and things were said in my childhood that I almost wish I could bring in an exorcist because they're still in my heart and I want them not to be part of me, but they are. Um, I'd be willing to bet there, if you gave everybody truth serum, um, there'd be more women than you think that you talk to every single day that have like grandma's voice in the back there whispering. Um, so if, if white women should be leading on anything or white people should be leading on anything, it, like, it would be learning how to shut up and listen, how to hear what you just said about being from Alabama and how your experience was different, how to stop telling people what their experience is, but let them tell you. Um, so speaking up is great unless you're drowning someone out. And, um, and we need to be lifting each other's voices up. Um, so I don't know what to do with my family's history. I don't know what to do with that, honestly. It's, but I imagine something. I'm going to do something with it. I, I just need to figure out what that is. Um, but one of the things I've learned is to recognize when it's not right for it to be my voice. Um, my name is Brianna. I'm a class of 2018 Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Um, I just had a question and, um, yeah. So, as a young person, um, I'm in my 20s, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room in their 20s, 30s, what advice would you give um, to women today of how to break through those male-dominated spaces that uh, we find ourselves in, whether in our careers, in our classes, um, in these, uh, in this world and this patriarchy? So I had to come to terms with something when I was um, researching for Women, War, and Peace, you know, because all you read about is rape and wartime and the terrible things that men do. And I was coming home every night and sitting down to dinner with my two sons and my husband. And, you know, after a while you start looking and thinking, like, what is wrong with you guys? You know, are you all evil? Um, and, and no, they're not. Of course they're not. Of course they're not. And what I, I finally got my head wrapped around this is that, in fact, most of them aren't. You know, Harvey Weinstein has, what, 90 accusers at this point? You know, the people who are terrible are kind of the minority. It's just they do it over and over again, right? And they also, not by coincidence, happen to be like the big alpha guys who are deciding how films get made and who's going to be a star and who's not going to be a star. That's not nothing that these things coincide, right? So, so it's, it's not just that the world is being run by men. It's being run by a narrow swath of men who benefit by a system that privileges aggression and violence and a lack of regard for other people's humanity and rights. Which is part of the reason I say that when women bring all of themselves into those rooms and start to really act like women, who might peel off from the alpha? Who might feel like other things are possible? Because men, in fact, are harder on each other about gender roles than they ever are on us, let's face it. Um, and if you've ever been a 13-year-old boy, which I'm pretty sure most of you haven't been, there's a lot of suffering in it um, and a lot of horrible choices to be made. So my advice is, be a woman, always be a woman. Bring what you know about life as a woman. Um, you know, what you know about taking care of the life business. And, and find the allies in the men, because there were more of them around you. Help them find their strength, help them speak out. Support them when they do. Don't tell them they're being sissies. <laughs> uh, find them attractive. Um, that's a real problem. <laughs> um, Let's, you know, so, because we outnumber those Harveys. We way outnumber those Harveys. Oh, wait, I have to tell you a Harvey story. Can I tell you a Harvey story? He used his button on me. Um, 
you know, the button that closes the door behind you. I went to him to talk to, uh, to him about something business related involving my family. And I went in and sat down and he asked what I went to talk about. And I said, Michael Eisner. And he just hit the button and the door closed behind me and locked. And I was like, nah! <laughs> but anyway, I've been so angry about Harvey lately. I mean, I really am. This Harvey thing is really hitting me hard because I knew him and, um, and I know, I knew exactly who he was the minute I met him. And I, I don't know why anybody doubted what was very plainly up on the surface. So I've been walking around like a lit fuse. And on Fifth Avenue, about six o'clock in the morning, I had to hail a cab. You need to understand, like I once got into an argument with a friend of mine. This is how anxious I get in conflict. I'm really not a conflict person. And I got into an argument with a friend of mine and I literally had a nosebleed from it. So I don't, I don't do conflict. But I'm waiting for a cab, this cab pulls up, the driver gets out, he goes to the back, he reaches for a girl who couldn't be any older than you, and he grabs her really roughly by the arm, so line crossed, yanks her out of the cab and starts yelling at her, you bitch, you bitch, blah, 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 you have to pay me. And she's crying and says, I forgot my wallet. And I said, how much does she owe you? And he said, $8. And I was like, really? <laughs> and I almost got into a fist fight with him. I stepped in between them, I said, let her go, and he shoved me, and I shoved him back, and all of a sudden, I'm in a shoving match. <laughs> me! And I, like, out of body experience, I was up looking down, thinking, well, this is interesting. <laughs> um, and I kept thinking, I, please hit me, because I would never hit you first, but I would really have never hit a person, and I really want to know what that feels like. <laughs> and so the girl, um, I finally convinced her to run off, and she left, and he had nothing left, and he turned to me, and he got right in my face, the way they do in baseball games, right? And he started yelling at me, and yelling at me, and like, in my old me, I would have been so afraid of shaking and crying and whatever else, and I'm standing there, I'm watching him like he's a, like a bug in a microscope, and I thought to myself, you know what, you shoved me, and then I shoved you, you actually know I'm just as strong as you are. This is all you have. This is it. This is the last trick in your bag of tricks, and it's ridiculous. The emperor is not wearing any clothes. You guys, the emperor is not wearing any clothes. So um, don't let anybody out shout you. I just started to laugh. I couldn't help it. I didn't do it on purpose. I just, it looked so ridiculous to me. Don't let anybody out shout you. Um, shouting is one of the dumbest and stupidest and the last of the resorts of scoundrels. Um, so never let anybody shut you down. Thank you. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm an MPH candidate coming up in May 2018. Um, you've had an incredibly diverse, if you will, career from Hot Girls Wanted to Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Um, can you talk fairly pragmatically, if you will, about how you arrived at where your heart's greatest joy met the world's deepest need? That's a, um, <laughs> I've never spoken really pragmatically in my life, so <laughs> I'll try to start now. Um, but it's a good question because, like, I've been really lucky, you know, honestly. I, I think of it as the the, the road was unrolling in front of me and I just kept walking it. And as I got past a certain age, I started thinking, well, I mean, it's never been a mistake so far to just trust it where it was taking me. So I'm just gonna keep trusting it. And that's the way I've been operating ever since. I, I have learned that every decision I've ever made out of fear has been a bad decision. Um, I've learned that anytime I ever felt tempted not to tell the truth, it was a terrible mistake. I have learned that um, it is amazing how much of a difference just to be generous in every interaction you have because you really never know who's gonna come back 20 years later and turn out to be running a foundation. <laughs> um, I mean, if you choose joy and you choose generosity, I honestly, I, this is the only thing that's mystical and religious about me. It will find you, it will. Not pragmatic a bit. <laughs> Sorry. I think one more, is one more okay? Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Yi Ting Shen. I'm a graduate of the engineering school from class 2001. Oh. I, w I work in a company that has uh, over 200,000 employees. We have a women's diversity network. And then the co-chair of the network, there are two chairs, one is men and one is a woman. Initially, I find it quite uh, intriguing, but actually working through that, I actually find the experience is somewhat uh, opening. I would say he opens the perspective in many ways. So I wonder your perspective of how we shall sort of interact, engage, and potentially partner with men, because we're living in a world that's almost half-half. Um, well, it is half-half. In fact, we're the majority. We're the majority. So the fact that we're considered diversity is odd, isn't it? It makes no sense at all. Um, so there's a mistake we often make about when we talk about ending patriarchy, um, because people who don't understand things think we want to replace it with matriarchy. And I had a mother. We all had mothers. Nobody wants to live in a matriarchy. Nobody wants that. <laughs> um, wh what we're saying is we're living way out of balance. Right? And we're not getting the full picture because everybody's not working on creating the picture. Um, so we're looking to, to walk side by side with men as our peers without an expectation of being punished or violated in exchange for that. It's pretty simple. Um, so if he is a man who understands that, and sometimes you have to wait a long time before he shows himself, um, then great. He's going to be one of your best and biggest allies. Um, just make sure he's the kind of man who understands what I said before about understanding when it is right for him to speak and when it isn't. I, Michael Moore spoke at the Women's March in January, and he was the only one that they had to cut the mic off because he wouldn't stop talking. <laughs> um, so. If he, if he understands how to bring humility to it. So, I mean, it's up to us to help men along with us, like to, to get them to be a little less afraid of what it is we're trying to accomplish, um, because they are afraid, right? The ground is shifting under their feet, and we have to help them with that. Um, and, and, but we need to insist it shifts. We need to insist, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Take my bag of tricks. You know what? We can auction off Lamus photo for the benefit of it. Oh, thank you, Abigail, for such a moving and funny and inspiring and powerful evening as our keynote tonight. It was so evident by your sharing and your sharing your toys with us and then the amazing, wonderful questions that were brought forth from this audience. It was a beautiful night. Thank you. So just want to say thank you to our audience, and we invite you to stay, build new relationships, and bond with your fellow alumni. Enjoy the evening, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>